Thank you, guys. Turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4, if you would. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And uh, we are so glad tonight to have these uh, couples together. We're grateful to God for how God is moving. And once you get to 2 Timothy chapter 4, go back to 2 Timothy chapter 3, all right? Thank you. 2 Timothy 4 was the last thing Paul wrote, but I need to talk to you out of chapter 3. In just a moment, I'll read verses 14 through 17. One of the most precious phrases in the Bible is the phrase, man of God. Man of God. Uh, There were a lot of men of God. There were a lot of women of God. Uh, There was one time when a lady saw a great miracle. She said, now I know that you are a man of God and that the Word of God is in your mouth. And you have that phrase being uh, attributed to people like Moses, what a man of God he was. Elijah, what a man of God he was. Elisha, what a man of God he was. Samuel, Everybody knew he was a man of God from Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south. And he was about the only man of God around in his day. There were a few others, but not very many. And then King David also specifically is referred to in the Bible as a man of God. And to be sure, there were other men of God. But these are just a few that were specifically set out to be a man of God. I've preached quite a few of ordination sermons, and as I was thinking this week about what I should say, what the Lord would have me to say, I kept thinking about this phrase, man of God. And in 2 Timothy 3, verses 14 through 17, the Apostle Paul is writing what would actually be his last letter. He was not far, he didn't really know it at the time, but he was not far from having his head severed from his shoulders, and uh, as I like to say, his body would go down, but his spirit would go up, amen? And uh, he was writing to his favorite preacher boy, and that is Timothy. And as he wrote to Timothy, he gave some great advice about the Scriptures, but he also gave some great advice for Timothy as he wanted so much for Timothy to be a man of God. And let me just tell you about the four people that we have here tonight that we're going to ordain. Jeff Howard, his wife Denise, he serves as our director of adult outreach. He's actually been on the staff uh, about five years longer than I have. He started in the year 2000 working not only in our bookstore, but then in our Next Generation ministry. And uh, we are so grateful to have him on our staff. He's one of the finest workers we have and just a diligent person. And we love him and Denise. They have two adult children, Joy, who is married to Phil, and also Jeremy. Let's thank God for Jeff Howard, all right? Amen. And then Daniel Harris, who has actually preached once from this pulpit. And uh, his wife, Hannah, whom I've known all her life, all right? And uh, she, he serves as the director of Bellevue's college ministry at The View. Four years ago, the Lord changed Daniel's life, and he has not been the same man since. In December 2015, he surrendered fully to Jesus. He began working at Bellevue in 2016 as a ministerial assistant, and now he serves with us full-time. He's a graduate of the University of Memphis. He's attending seminary, working on his Master of Divinity at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary out of Louisville, and he and Hannah met while he was serving here at Bellevue. Let's thank the Lord for Daniel Harris. Amen. You get those kind of, you know, applause and those extra yells when you work in the college ministry, all right? So, okay. And then there's Dane Leak and Kerry. He has worked as a ministerial assistant here at Bellevue in our Next Generation ministry, also with our adults. 
He now serves in Texas as the high school pastor at Prestonwood Baptist Church at their North Campus in Dallas. He is a graduate of Arkansas State University. He currently is pursuing a master's degree at Mid-America Seminary, and this fall he's transferring over to my alma mater, and that is Southwestern Baptist Theological uh, Seminary in Fort Worth. Dane and Carrie met while he was serving here at the Next Generation Ministry. Let's thank the Lord for Dane Leak, okay? Amen. And then Nathan Stanfield, uh, he is married to Stephanie. He serves as our coordinator on our staff for guest services. That's a big job. And he began as a ministerial assistant in the Next Generation Ministry. Later on, he moved to the area of guest services. He's a graduate also of the University of Memphis. He'll start his Master of Divinity at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary this fall. Nathan and Stephanie met also at Bellevue. Just about all these guys met at Bellevue. Let's thank the Lord for Nathan Stanfield. Now, if you will, look in your Bibles with me very quickly, and let me just tell you what I really felt the Lord wanted me to do. I've preached quite a few ordination sermons. I just felt like the Lord wanted me to give you what I, my top ten list for a man of God, okay? This is not an, exege this is not an exegetical verse-by-verse -verse sermon. Now, if you tell my preaching professors that. Some of them are still alive. I'm going to get in trouble, all right? Uh, we always do verse by verse in the seminary. But today we're going to do verse with verse. Nothing wrong with that. And uh, I just want to share with you what I think are 10 of the most important areas for anybody going into full-time ministry, okay? So I hope it's a blessing to all of us here tonight, not just to the four men and their wives who are being ordained. Look there at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. Paul says, You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood, Timothy, you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Jesus. All Scripture, everybody say those two words together, all Scripture, not some Scripture, but all Scripture is inspired. Literally, God breathed, inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that, and here it is, the man of God. Say that with me, please. The man of God. So that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. First thing you got to know if you're going to be a man of God is you must know you've been born again. You've got to know that you're saved. You can't be a man of God unless Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. He says here in verses 14 and 15, you, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. You know, theologians discuss over what did he mean by sacred writings. By the time Paul wrote this, there were some gospels that were circulating. And maybe he was talking exclusively about the Old Testament, or maybe he was already referring to some of the writings that would become our New Testament as the sacred writings that, sto that told specifically about the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever it was, Paul was saying to Timothy, you need to know that you're born again. And we've talked with these young men. They shared beautiful testimonies of how even though they had been in church and all of that, they, like everybody else, had to repent of their sins. They had to turn from sin and turn to God through Jesus Christ to be saved. If you don't repent, the Bible says, you'll perish. And so they have repented of their sins. They have also believed not just about God, not just about Jesus, but they have believed 
on Jesus. They have trusted him. They believe that Jesus died for their sins. They believe that Jesus was buried for them. They believe that Jesus was buried so that whenever they get buried, they're going to rise from the dead because Jesus didn't stay in the grave, did he? He rose bodily and victoriously and eternally from the grave, and he's alive now. And they've done all of that. They have repented, and they have believed, and they have, at a moment in time, we heard glorious testimonies how all four of these young men have received. Did you like me calling you young there? Okay, great. All right, good. Received the Lord Jesus Christ in a moment in time. And I want to ask you, have you ever done that? That's not just for preachers. Have you ever repented? Have you ever believed? Have you ever received Christ as Lord and Savior? The first thing you got to ask yourself, if you're going to be a man of God or even a woman of God, if you're going to really be a child of God, have you ever been born again? You need to know that you're saved. Second thing is this, you need to be Spirit-filled. You need to be Spirit-filled. Now, I believe that the Bible teaches that the moment you get saved, the Holy Spirit baptizes you into the body of Christ, and you are made to drink of the Holy Spirit. I just quoted to you a verse out of 1 Corinthians 12. We are baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit, and we're all made to drink of the Holy Spirit. Our body becomes the temple of the living God. The moment we pray and invite God, Christ to come into our life, the Holy Spirit comes to live within us. You know, nowadays there's some people that say, well, that's kind of right, but the baptism takes place later. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible never commands anybody to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. That's because it automatically happens at conversion. What the Bible says and what it commands you to do is once you are saved, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that filling, Jesus said, is from within going out. It's an overflowing of the Holy Ghost. It's rivers of living water coming out of you, walking in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. I love it that the disciples who had already been baptized by the Holy Spirit at, on the day of Pentecost, that's when everybody that was a believer got baptized that day. And from then on, everybody that would get saved would get baptized. But even after that, they needed a fresh filling. The Bible says, for instance, in Acts 4.31, that when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all, these are believers, these are people who are already baptized in the Holy Spirit, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak the Word of God with boldness. And they took their, their territory for Jesus Christ. Everywhere they went, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And one of the ways you'll know you're filled with the Holy Spirit is you're telling other people about Jesus Christ. Jesus wants us. If we want to be men and women of God, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then thirdly, if you want to be a man of God, especially a man of God in the ministry, you need to be God called. God called. And there are really a couple of things here. You need to be called to a position. You need to be called to some area in the body of Christ, some spiritual gift that God has given you. Paul, for instance, knew exactly what position he was in. He starts off his major theological treatise, which is the book of Romans. In Romans 1, verse 1, Paul says, I am a bondservant of Christ Jesus. I am called as an apostle. I am sanctified. I am set apart for the gospel of God. Paul said later on, he would say, I don't like to go where the gospel has already been preached. I like to go to places where nobody knows anything about Jesus. That's why when you see him in his latter days, he wants to stop by Rome on his way to Spain. Spain was where he wanted to go when he got arrested, and God said, well, you're going to go to Rome, all right. You won't get to Spain. Glad you want to go. But Paul just had in his heart, I don't want to preach on top of another man's ministry. I don't want to build on somebody else's foundation. I want to go where they don't know anything about Jesus. He was uniquely 
gifted as an apostle to the Gentiles. And he said, I want to tell them about Jesus Christ. I want to go into the synagogue and for several weeks, maybe even months, preach to them and show them from the Scripture that Jesus is the Messiah. And then once they kick me out like they always do, I want to go to the Gentiles and tell them that Jesus died for their sins as well and they can be born again. Paul knew exactly where he fit in the position of an apostle. But then also, you're not only called to a position, you're called to a place. The Bible says, for instance, in Acts 16, verse 10, Luke is writing, he was a companion of Paul on his missionary journey, and he says, when he had seen the vision, when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now, what had happened there was the Holy Spirit wouldn't let them go to the northeast. He wouldn't let them go to the southwest. And so they wind up in Troas. Paul just hunkers down and prays, and he has a vision where a man comes to him from Macedonia and said, come over and help us. And Paul sensed in his heart that the Holy Spirit was saying, I want you to go to Macedonia. He was called not only to a position, but to a place. And I want to say this to everybody, but also to these four guys being ordained. God will call you to a place. And I want to say this as nicely as I can. Don't jockey for a position. Don't try to put yourself in a place. Don't try to manipulate and get your buddies to recommend you to a certain position. Don't do any of that stuff. Let me tell you something. You just stay in love with the Lord Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ knows where you are, and when He gets ready to move you, He knows how to move you. Amen? He's going to put you in a role, and then He's going to put you in a position. And don't you dare try to do that on your own. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't manipulate. Don't play around with friendships and say, hey, I, I want to go over there. I, I think that would be a good place for me. You know what? You don't know what would be a good place for you, but God does. And sometimes God will put you someplace that you never would have chosen, and it comes out to be one of the greatest places you've ever been. And it do, God do, not only works through you, but He works in you, and it never would have happened if you tried to manipulate that yourself. Be a God-called man of God. Number four, a God-called man of God is equally yoked. I'm talking about if you have a spouse, that spouse needs to love Jesus. Now listen to me. Paul didn't have a spouse. Everybody's not called to have a spouse, okay? Most people are. Most people in the ministry are. And what I'm saying to you is this. If you are ever ordained in ministry and you don't have a spouse, some people teach that you shouldn't be in the ministry if you don't have a spouse. Well, you just kicked the Apostle Paul out of the ministry. So I think maybe you ought to reconsider your ways, all right? But here's the deal. If you don't have a spouse, guess who you're married to? Jesus, all right? Pretty good spouse, amen? And you're going to be equally yoked. Jesus will be the one who guides you. But if you are married to a woman and you are in the ministry, it's not just you that's called, she's called too. My wife says it best, God never calls half of a flesh. He always calls both people. And so, ladies, tonight, I won't read your names again, but to anybody in this room, if your husband is called into the ministry, you are too. Don't fight against that. If you want to use biblical language, don't fight against, don't kick against the goads. Don't do that. Don't be rebellious. Man, just come in there and be equally yoked. 1 Timothy 3.2 says, an overseer then must be above reproach, husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, res 
respectable, hospitable, and able to teach. You need to be married to a godly person if you're married, and she needs to accept the call as well. 2 Corinthians 6.14 is a general statement for all of us. Don't be bound together. I believe that marriage is a wonderful application of this. I don't think any Christian ought to marry a non-Christian, especially a pastor. Don't be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness? I'm telling you, more problems have come to the ministry with people being unequally yoked than just about anything I can think of. You need to be one. You need to pray together. You need to minister together. And the spouse needs to come alongside. And then number five, you need to be a prayer warrior. And I don't have, make any apology for that word warrior because prayer is not only intimacy with the Lord, it is battle with the devil. And the Bible says in Acts 6, 4, after the distribution of the offerings became too much for the apostles and the leaders of the church, the pastors, the elders, the Bible says that they gave that over to what I believe were the first deacons, and they said, we will devote ourselves to two things, primarily prayer and the ministry of the Word of God. Do you see that prayer comes first? You need to learn to talk with God before you try to talk for God, all right? You need to be, spend time with the Lord. And you know, when Moses would spend time in the tabernacle, he'd come out with the glow of God on his face, right? Let me say this to you. We're not Moses. We get that. But at the same time, the God who spoke to Moses will speak to us when we pray. And when you spend time with the Lord in prayer, you won't have to tell anybody that you pray a lot. You know what? It will just show in your preaching, in your living. I can tell and you can too when somebody has really spent time with the Lord. There's just something about them. They're more like Jesus. They're not arrogant. They're humble, and they're hungry to do the will of God, and they just want to see the name of Jesus glorified. They're not big shots. They're not talking about themselves all the time. You spend time with God in prayer, and I'm telling you, God will do things in your ministry, in your marriage, in every part of your life. If you'll just spend that time with God in secret prayer, oh, my friend, God will do things that you, you cannot even believe He will do. It'll be exceeding abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think. And then number six, be a Bible proclaimer. Don't just say, well, I think this and I think that. Well, to be honest with you, who cares? I want to know what does the Bible say? What does God say on a matter? Timothy, or Paul said to Timothy in chapter 3, there in 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, all Scripture is inspired by God. It's God-breathed, and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. He would go on to say in chapter 2, or in chapter 4, rather, these famous words, preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Did you see that? Preach when it's popular and when it's not popular. Preach, don't just preach little feel-good sermons. There needs to be some teaching. There needs to be some reproof. There needs to be some correction. And there needs to be some training for righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Preach the Word. Be ready in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they'll accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. And that's what we've got today, man. You can pull up on the internet anybody you want to, to preach anybody, anything you want to hear, you can get it on the internet now. If you believe it's okay, to marry people of the same sex, you can find preachers that'll preach. That's okay. They don't get it out of the Word. 
If you want to, if you want to, if you want to hear a sermon by somebody that says it's okay to have an abortion, man, you can find that on the on the internet. You can look up anything you want to do, but you won't get it from the Word of God. If you want to talk to somebody and say, you know what, one race is superior to the other race, you can find that anywhere you want to. That's all over the internet. But you know what? You won't find that in the Word of God. What you're going to find is everybody was born and came from one couple, Adam and Eve. And I like what Dr. Rogers said. We also came from a drunken sailor named Noah. Amen? (laughs) We all come from the same people. We're all biologically kin. Don't get into this stuff about, you know, there's this race and that race. Listen, there's the human race. There's the human race. And if you try to divide it any other way, you're a troublemaker. And God won't put up with it if you are in the ministry. You need to make sure that you are doing all that you can do to really, really, really preach the Word of God. A Bible proclaimer. What I tell people is, People say, well, do you believe this? I just say, I believe the Bible. I just blame it on the Bible. Just preach the Bible. I had a guy tell me a long time ago, if you'll preach the Bible, Steve, people will accuse you of being smart. Amen? (laughs) Just preach the Word of God. Number seven, you ought to be a soul winner. A soul winner. You ought to be telling people about Jesus, and you ought to be winning them to faith in Christ. Now, there are a lot of people nowadays that say, I don't like that word win. We don't win anybody. Well, don't tell Paul that. Because Paul talked about soul winning. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 and following, he said, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all men, that I may, what? Say it out loud. Win more. To the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might, say it out loud, Win Jews to those who are under the law as under the law, though not myself being under the law, so that I might say it out loud. Win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, he's talking about the Gentiles, as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might say it out loud. Win those who are without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might say it out loud. When the weak, I have become all things to all men that I may by all methods or means save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel. Can you say that? I can't say that. I don't do everything I do for the sake of the gospel. Most of us don't. If anybody, I, probably nobody in here does. But Paul could say, I do everything I do. I do all things for the sake of the gospel so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. And then he says in verse 24, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize. They didn't know anything about everybody that participates is supposed to get a trophy. Oh, my soul. Don't get me off on that. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? And then he says, run in such a way that you may Say it out loud. Win. Win, 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 win. Don't tell me we shouldn't win people to Jesus. You need to share the gospel, and you give them the opportunity to repent, believe, and receive. And when that happens, you've led somebody to the Lord. You have won them to Christ. And I want to encourage you guys, be a soul winner. And then a disciple maker. Jesus said in his resurrected state in the area of Galilee to his disciples in Matthew 28, 19, these famous words, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then the Bible says about the apostles, what, they, what were they always doing? They were making disciples. Acts 14, 21, after they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. Now, making disciples includes winning people to Jesus. That's the tip of the spear of making disciples. And then they get baptized. He said, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What's that all about? To get them to go public 
about their faith in Christ and also to unite with the fellowship. And then he says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. That whole process is making disciples. Uh, Peter talked about it in these, these words. He said, we need to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So once you get saved, you need to get baptized. And once you get baptized, you need to start learning all the things that Jesus has taught us, and you need to grow in grace. And you need to be a disciple maker. You need to be sure that you're teaching people how to lead people to Christ, how to grow in grace, and that they are doing that after they spend time with you. Number nine, you need to be spiritually accountable. You need to have people who talk to you about your walk with the Lord. This is so important for ministers and for all Christians. The Bible says in Acts 13 verse 2, while they, these five leaders, these five teachers that were ministering to the Lord. It says, while they were ministering to the Lord. What is that? They were worshiping God. They were praising God. They were talking to God in prayer. We think about ministry. The first act of ministry is to the Lord. (laughs) You minister to the Lord first. And while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart, sanctify for me Barnabas and Saul, a team, accountability partners, for the work to which I have called them. Guys, I want to tell you something. You need some guys that you can be accountable with. You need some guys that ask you hard questions. How is your prayer life? How is your walk in the Word? What are you reading in Scripture? How is your thought life? Are you being faithful in your thoughts to your spouse? How is your ministry? Are you really working or are you being lazy? On and on. You get, if, listen, if you don't have somebody asking you the hard questions and then turning around and saying, have you just lied to me about anything that you said? If you don't have that, you need that. You've got to have that in ministry. You've got to be accountable. Paul had Barnabas. Later he would have other people. The Bible says in James 5, 16, therefore confess your sins to one another. You've got to have somebody that you can go to and say, look, I'm struggling in this area. Everybody in this room struggles. Not an amen in the bunch. Too late. Too late. But I'm telling you, every one of you needs somebody looking you right in the eye and lovingly challenging you, not in an arrogant way, but just saying, I love you too much to see you fall. I don't want you to be a casualty in the Christian life. I don't want you bringing shame on the name of Jesus or on your family or anybody else. So I'm going to lovingly get in your face and talk to you in a manner where you need to talk to me. You can do it to me too. We'll just, we'll just confess our faults to one another and pray for one another that we may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. Don't you believe we'd be all be better off if we had some people talking to us that way and loving on it? That's love right there. That's real love right there, where I love you too much to leave you in sin and maybe to open a door to be spiritually without accountability. And then the last thing is this, number 10, you need to be a loving shepherd. I love what Paul said to the elders of Ephesus In Acts chapter 20, verse 28, he said, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church, the ecclesia of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Be a shepherd. I heard somebody say it a long time ago. I have no idea who it was, but I've said it many times. Real shepherds smell like sheep. If you don't love people, you're in the wrong business. If you don't want to laugh with them when they laugh and cry with them when they cry, go do something else. It's not just about getting up and preaching. 
That's wonderful. It's not just about leading and leadership. That's wonderful. But it's about loving people. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And if you're a pastor, you need to love your people. I love what Dr. Rogers said when he said, I came to Bellevue years ago and fell into an ocean of love, and I've been swimming ever since. Nobody could talk like that guy. What a sweet man of God. You need to love your brothers and sisters, even when they're not easy to love. God will help you, but be a good shepherd. And I'll tell you how you'll know if you're a shepherd or a hireling. When it gets tough, a hireling runs. But when it gets tough, a shepherd stays and takes care of the sheep. Don't run. Don't be a hired hand. Be a man of God. Amen?